Today, we're doing a half session today on uh, cover crops and soil health. Um, and uh, what we'll be covering today is uh, I'm going to be talking about the voles and the slugs. We've got another speaker to talk about some of the beneficial insects. And we got a speaker panel to talk about some of the seed issues. In the afternoon, uh, Steve Coleman and his group are going to be coming in and talking about some of the new uh, fertilizer recommendations and uh, going over, over that, uh, some of that information. So uh, we kind of split that out. So we got about a half a day here on soil health, and then the rest will be um, kind of our standard Ohio recommendations, okay? So um, as I said, my name's Jim Horman. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about controlling the slugs and the voles, okay? So about two years ago, <clears throat> we had a really big slug problem and a vole problem about the same time, and, and I was asked to start looking into it, so I started visiting some farms and taking pictures and gathering a lot of information, and I, I don't remember which one I started on. I think it might have been the slugs because that was kind of the, the big issue. And uh, it was interesting, as we started visiting these farms, I'd see all these vole holes, you know, the burrows and things like that. And then I started gathering the information and it's just amazing. All the information is uh, pretty much similar on what conditions the slugs like and what conditions the voles prefer. So, and then the other, well, I don't know if that's good news or bad news, because usually when I go to these fields, I find both. But also when it comes to the controls, you'll see the things that we recommend on how to manage them, guess what? about 90% the same. So if you have a slug problem, good chance you might also have a bowl issue, uh, and, but the management's gonna be somewhat the same on how to, how to help with both of those, okay? So that's kind of what we found out. So why do we have more slugs and bowls? And uh, I just put this slide in there, and it's, I actually took it off the slug slide, and I kind of combined these. So wherever it says slug, just add bowls in there. But we have more long-term no-till. That just means we have a better stable environment for both the slugs and the bowls. And we have cool, wet springs. Whenever you have cool, wet springs, uh, that leads to higher slug population. It also increases your voles because some of the voles need standing water. The, the meadow voles really like that standing water uh, in order to produce. And they're very, very prolific. Uh, so if you give them the water and you give them the environment, they're going to have a bunch of, of uh, babies, I guess, okay? More green vegetation, it's just more food and habitat, and the more cover crops we got, just more food and habitat, okay? Uh, um, mild winters really helps both of them. The slugs um, uh, will survive, and they'll start to lay their eggs uh, earlier in the spring, and if you have a, a nice fall, they'll lay eggs later into the fall. So you've just got more chance for uh, the kind of spread out those populations, and they can really produce at that uh, at that rate. Same way with the um, uh, the voles. The voles need uh, forty percent more energy in a cold winter. Now, one of the things that, that I've found is that most of these populations are highly cyclical. That means about every two to five years they crash. And last year, if you remember. We had a cold winter, okay? I, part of the winter at least was cold, and we didn't have a lot of snow. Well, when you do that, what happens is, at least for the slugs, the slugs dig down into the soil, and as that cold gets further and further down, uh, they tend to, to freeze out. And this year, we had a cold winter at times, but we also had quite a bit of moisture. So as the water table moves up and the frost level moves down, the slugs get caught in the middle of that, and uh, so you really thin out the populations, okay? As long as you don't have, you know, a ton of residue out there that, that insulates them or, you know, they can get away. But uh, again, that's kind of what we're seeing, all right? Uh, with the voles, uh, the these cold winters are tough on them because if you got snow, they can burrow under the snow, and uh, but they need 40% more energy. Usually their numbers on both the slugs and the voles go down in the wintertime. They're at their lowest level coming into the spring. So we've kind of had two tough years in a row. 
And uh, we expect now that that cycle is kind of broken, you know, it's, it's, it's crashed, but now they're going to probably start to rebuild. So just a few things there. One of the other things, though, with the slugs is the neonicotinoids. They're finding out John Tooker at Penn State has found that some of our seed treatments, the neonics are the, the cruiser, the poncho, the gaucho, some of those things that they're putting on uh, the seed, uh, is actually harming the predators, okay? It's taking out what we call the lions, your, your crabid, crabid D, uh, or crabid beetles, those little black beetles. And so there's, there's some concern there, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, all right? Slimy, they need the moist habitat. This just describes that slug environment. We'll talk about the slugs first. This slide came from Kelly Tillman, who's our OSU, Ohio State University uh, entomologist. Uh, we have about 80,000 slug species. There's about 20 in Ohio. There's really only one that we worry about too much, and that's called the gray garden slug. And the reason being is it's highly prolific, okay? It has the most, lays the most eggs, okay? Uh, most of these pests came from Europe or North Africa. And yes, slugs are related to snails. Snails just have a hard shell, okay? So tells you a little bit about uh, some of the biology, or we'll get into the biology a little bit more. Here's some of their, uh, what they like and they dislike, okay? So they love kind of these humid, moist conditions. Matter of fact, they need to have that to survive. Most of the time in the spring, if we have a really long, wet spring, that's when we have the issue. Most years, the corn will, can tolerate uh, slug damage and it'll outgrow it. Okay, so you got about 21 to 28 days there. If you can get that corn up and growing quickly, that's your best uh, defense against slugs and the voles because the voles can only reach up so so high, and then uh, and they also migrate in and out. Both of these do. The slugs will migrate in, and and so will the the voles. Okay, um, they like low winds, cracks and crevices. They love that surface residue, no-till conditions. They actually like well-drained soils. Okay, they like temperatures that are a little cooler. So the spring and the fall is when they're the most active in the summer, they'll actually go to sleep for a while, they'll dig down into the soil, and they don't need to eat for you know, a couple months. They can, uh, they can live that way, okay? Uh, they like the light rain, fog, dark shady. They actually like more, a little bit more acid soils and the clay. They don't like the sand quite as much. It's probably a little too scratchy, uh, and it desiccates them. But they really love these cotyledons. So soybeans is really our biggest issue. Now come to find out, you know, we also have issues with corn, but we have a few things that we can use in corn. We can use trap crops. They really don't like to eat corn unless there's nothing else to eat. So if you have a huge slug problem and there's nothing else to eat, they'll just take your corn down to nothing, okay? But it all depends on where that growing point's at. And they really love a lack of predators. On the right-hand side, we have the things that they dislike, okay? So I'm going to start at the bottom. We can get the predators in there. Salt. Copper, sulfates, vinegar, and garlic have all been used kind of on small basis in gardens. And then on a small basis, they can be effective. Most of the time, we're probably not going to use those, though, in uh, the commercial agriculture setting. Uh, they do not like plants that have high lignin. They like the low C to N, okay? Something that's very vegetative. They don't like the lime. They don't like sand. They don't like bright sunlight, those type of things. Uh, all the other things are just kind of the opposite of the other side, so let's move on. All right, this is the one right here. This is that gray garden slug. We've got about four other species. Uh, we do see, sometimes we'll see some of these, but when we look at how many eggs they produce versus this one, this is the one that, that is in the largest number in the Midwest, okay? And again, all these came from, from Europe. We need to understand a little bit about slug parts and some of the anatomy. And one of the reasons being is um, if you look at this mantle right here, this is kind of a, a key area. And you notice right here, this is uh, kind of where their respiratory, their lungs and everything uh, is produced. We did a little bit of an experiment here in Ohio when I was uh, still with the uh, extension. Uh, we'd heard that radishes, that slugs are really attracted to the radish, but the best way I can put this is when the slugs were around radish, they got a little sluggish. 
Okay, they just didn't, they weren't healthy. And so we started investigating that, and I looked into the literature, and come to find out, radishes are very high in sulfur. And what happens is, uh, the, the slugs love the radish, they love all that sugar, but they can't digest that sulfur, uh, that sulfur dioxide, okay? So it builds up gas, and they can't expel it. You know, a simple way to say that is they just can't fart it out. So they actually blow up. And they will literally, I've seen a couple pictures of this, they'll get a bubble underneath that mantle and it'll just literally explode. So we're thinking uh, that the radish, we're, they're doing some more research on this, that if you put radish in, your, in with your uh, cover crops, only about a pound or two, that if you can get those to grow, the slugs are attracted to it, so are the earthworms. It doesn't hurt the earthworms, but it tends to make the slugs. Now, we also have some antidotal evidence, okay? So I've been to several farms, and guys will tell me, hey, what's going on with these different fields? Because we have slugs in one, we don't in the other. So we go, they broadcast the seed. That's the first mistake. Really, if you have a chance, try to drill. If you've got slugs in bowls, drill your cover crops it'll be a lot better because that's all food for them so we go out there and we would look and they would eat the hearts out of these seeds okay and uh, where we had it broadcasted in one field there was hardly any rye okay they really love rye in another field they had almost a perfect stand of rye and they did the exact same thing so started asking some questions and I've seen this in, in like four or five fields and I said, what did you plant the year before? And in every case where they had pretty much good cereal rye, they had also planted the radish. So did we find some slugs? Yes, there was a few there, but they, there weren't enough of them to reach economic damage, uh, to reach levels that they actually destroyed the crop. So, so you know, you might want to try it. I'm not going to say that it's going to work every time, but at least we're, we're trying to do a study now. I know Kelly said she was looking at some of this stuff. She said it would take her about three years and the problem is now of course she started her study last year when slug populations are low and the word I'm getting back is well it's inconclusive because we just haven't had that much slug damage yet okay so we may just it may take a couple years to be able to prove that point all right but or disprove it so we'll just take that with kind of a grain of salt here's kind of that that uh, slug cycle um, you know, we start off with these slug eggs. Uh, they form uh, just baby slugs. You know, look at this slug here. This is a penny, and look how tiny they are. They're small. Uh, they're very small. Most of the time when they, uh, they're eating just fungi and algae when they start off. And then when they get to the juvenile stage, they really start to dig into your cover crops and then into the adult stage. So these things can live um, uh, longer than a year. Uh, and again, we're looking at how many eggs they are. Here's the big thing. Those great garden slugs lay uh, 200 eggs per year. Most slug species only lay 30 to 50. That's why that great garden slug is such a problem. Okay, These eggs need to be in a moist condition. So that gives us an idea how we might be able to change some of the environmental conditions. So what some guys are doing is they're using strip tillage. And they'll go through and dry that out, that area out, and uh, that will keep some of the slugs away. Now, if they're still hungry and if there's not food around there, they're going to attack. But generally, it helps for a little while. Things like rotary hoeing. I've had a couple farmers that are, are doing that and having really good luck. They had really big uh, slug problems. And they started to rotary hoe in the fall and in the spring. And just by drying out that environment a little bit, uh, raising that residue, they, they kill an awful lot of these eggs and they dislodge them. Okay, So for the slugs, that works quite well. If you're going to try to do this for the voles, what you need to be doing is, is try to do that uh, just right after um, uh, sunup. Okay, for a couple hours, the voles generally in the summer 
are uh, feeding at night, but they have to feed about every four hours. But they do most of their foraging at night, okay? But early in the morning or right before dusk, that's sometimes when they're active. And if you were going to go out there and you want to try to take care of both your slugs and your voles, that would be the time to go out there. And so what you'll do is disrupt their nest. You might even poke a few of them. And uh, it tends to keep their populations down a little bit, okay? If you have a big, big slug or vole issue, okay? Oh, here's the key, key number you need to look at. If all the offspring survived, one gray garden slug could have 90,000 grandchildren and 27 million great-grandchildren, okay? So they are highly prolific. Um, one of the areas, if you want to study about slugs, Penn State, John Tucker has done a lot of work there, but also Oregon State. So they're pretty much in areas that have a very high moisture. We don't see them in the Midwest a lot, uh, especially in the drier uh, areas they, they, because they need that moisture, okay? Um, how much do they eat? Well, some of these juveniles, they feed through the spring and sometimes into the summer. They can do a lot of damage. They can eat about two and a half times their weight. That's one reference, okay? Came from Oregon State. Um, juveniles and adults, you know, they burrow down. They, they rest during the summer. But if you have a cool summer, they will stay active much longer, okay? So really depends on, on weather conditions, okay? Most of them will be mature in about five to six months, and then they can live anywhere from six about 18 months, that's about the, the um, most that the longest that they'll live. This shows the uh, cycle for Indiana. Purdue has some pretty good information also. But you can see there that they do, uh, they overwinter eggs or they do their egg laying uh, in the spring, early in the spring, and then usually uh, later in September, October. Sometimes that, that really varies depending on weather. If we get a really cold snap early, you know, they'll, they'll stop and they'll, they, you know, they'll burrow down. Into the, into the soil. So it really depends on the weather, and that's why these, they're very cyclical. Okay, Every about two to five years, uh, the, it kind of boom and bust is what, what we see. But the damage, they'll, they'll damage canola, soybeans, corn, alfalfa, small grains. Uh, they go after the leaves. They'll go after the seeds. Um, they uh, estimate about 20% of the no-till acreage loses some kind of yield uh, where they have uh, these slugs. This was Pennsylvania. This came from John Tucker at Pennsylvania. That was his estimate, okay? Uh, yield losses in the mid-Alamic, they estimated also at about 20%, okay? Uh, final damage can be worse than soybeans because usually when you have a problem, they will hit those cotyledons. That's that growing point. If they take that off, they can wipe a field out in, in uh, about a day or two. If you're not watching your fields very closely, you need to be scouting, uh, you can really get stand loss. Usually on the corn, the growing point's below the ground. And so as long as that growing point is safe, they can shred a few leaves. But if, that, if they get to the growing point, then, then that corn's going to die out. So I'll show you some pictures on that. This is what they do. They hollow out the seeds. They shred the, the holes. And they, they can even scar your roots and your tubers. Okay, So that's what they do. If they kill that growing point, that plant is dead. This is kind of that open slot. If it's very wet out, one of the key things you want to do is make sure you get that planter slot closed because an open slot allows those slugs to feast. That's just a slug highway. It's also a vole highway. The voles will just go from one plant to another. You made it very easy. So one of the things you want to do is just either wait uh, or make sure you get that slot closed. The other thing you can do is put the seed a little deeper. So uh, if it's deeper in the soil, generally it'll have a little bit better root system. And then when it comes out, hopefully it'll grow faster. Uh, and and uh, uh, also for the voles, they can't smell down only about two inches. So it makes it a little harder. They have to dig in the soil. Now, in order for that to work, you got to have good soil structure, right? So a lot of guys are, if you're trying to do this on a, a conventional type field and you don't have good soil structure, it's not going to work. But where we're doing soil health, we're highly recommending that you guys plant just a little bit deeper on, on soybeans and plant deeper on corn. Okay, two, we have some guys two, three inches on the corn just to, to give that corn a little bit better um, chance to get up and growing. I actually, uh, uh, by mistake, a couple years ago, I was out in a field 
collecting some soil along a fence row for some experiments I was going to do. And I found a guy that had plowed corn, okay? And he had corn ears that were down probably six inches in the soil. And this was mid-March, okay? And it was a warm March. But those, those corn kernels were already sprouted, had a sprout on them, and were up that big, this, hot, this far underneath the ground, and had roots down this deep. Okay, and it was trying to push its way up. And I tell you what, with the way the soil looked, I think it probably would have made it. Now, would it have got frosted? So who knows? But uh, they do have a lot of push on, on that. If you've got good soil structure, you should be able to make that work. Okay? So watch when you plant, especially soybeans and in, in the wheat uh, residue. That's where we, we see most of the time uh, planted soybeans and wheat residue. That's where we have a, a big issue there. Just showing some of the damage. You can see that at the top there. Um, the slugs prevented the soybean establishment. They greatly lowered the, the yields. So there'll be areas in your field where, where those slugs are, are hanging out. And often you'll, you'll see this. One day it looks pretty good, and within a day or two, all of a sudden it can be, be thinned out and be gone. Okay? Um, corn yield damage uh, above the growing point is less damaging than when you get it below. Uh, once they cut off that uh, growing point, well, then you're done. So cool temperatures is what slows those plants down. Usually time is on our side. We've got about 21 to 28 days that we have to worry about for most of the voles and slugs. That's what most of the literature is talking about. If you can get that corn plant up, get it growing, or that soybean plant up, you can generally outgrow the damage but some of these years you know things just don't work out okay again they like the seedlings they love that succulent vegetation all right this is slug damage it's the most severe from emergence up to about four leaf stage once you get it above the fourth uh, four leaf stage generally uh, you're not going to have as much problem they will feed on brace roots and things like that but usually the damage is minor and this is information came from Purdue University and uh, also from from John Tucker. Okay? This is some data. Uh, this is a field in Ohio, Van Wert County. The Renner family, I've been working with them a little bit. And uh, what's going on with this picture? Well, what they did uh, up there at the top, you can see the yellow. That's all slug damage. I believe it was in soybeans the next year. The bottom part, you can see the green, you can see right to the line. So, what did they do different? Well, where the yellow's at, that's where they took off corn silage. And uh, they took it off three weeks before they harvested the rest of the corn. They got their cereal rye planted early, and they got it planted really thick. I think it's the thick part that we're concerned about. That's where the slugs hung out. The, the green part there down below, that's where they took the corn off for grain three weeks later. They planted the cover crop. Uh, mainly cereal rye, but it didn't get nearly as tall, and you can see there that the soybeans did a lot better. So one of the things we can do is try to open that canopy up. Number one, you know, you can mow. If it gets really tall and really dense, that's an ideal slug habitat. But one of the things we can do is put in 50% of your cover crop be something that dies out. That way you get some growth, but then it'll open up and allows the wind to get in there, and they, they don't like soil that have been, you know, started to dry out. It starts to desiccate them a little bit, okay? Also, by mowing it, we also allow the predators to get in. So your hawks, your owls, your fox, all those things on both the slugs and the voles, okay? So we'll talk about predators next in a little bit. So those are some things that we're kind of learning that can help you with this. Now, NRCS does not make chemical or uh, biological uh, recommendations. Everything that I'm giving you came from extension, okay? Um, so just want to make sure you understand we're only be able to provide you with the information that extension is already approved. So everything I got here came basically from Purdue and uh, from um, uh, Penn State, places like that. All right. Here uh, on, on the chemical recommendations. Okay. So for the uh, ground beetles, these are the guys that we want to promote. These are the lions of the uh, no-till field. So this is what we're looking for. These things eat black cutworm, true army worm, stalk borer, wire worms, and slugs. 
uh, they will eat their weight every day in weed seed and slug eggs, okay, and things like that. So these are the guys we want to promote. Now, what's the problem? They're only, they only have maybe about 10 or 20 eggs that they lay per year. So the neonics really take them out. Uh, they, they, um, Dave Brandt talked about this yesterday. Uh, he has a little video that I, I got from Kelly Tillman, too. We're not going to run it today. But they put a little Petri dish out there, put just a drop of neonic in the, in the corner, and within seconds, the, uh, the crabidae beetle is up on its, on its back and it's waving its legs, okay? So uh, part of the problem is the slugs can ingest those things and can take it into their bodies and it has no effect on them. And then when they excrete it or when they get eaten, they, uh, the, those beetles get like a double dose of it, okay? And so they're exposed to this, and we're taking out a lot of those. So we've got to be a little careful uh, overusing uh, s- some of that. So what is a recommendation? Uh, I've talked to uh, a number of extension educators about this, and what you can do is on corn it's it's pretty hard because you know we got a lot of pests on corn we don't and it's a high value crop but on soybeans we're putting a lot of seed out there where where you might want to consider if you're trying to improve soil health is maybe cut back on your insecticide treatment on your soybeans because there's not quite as many predators out there that really hurts the soybeans got more seed out there they can compensate and it, that'll allow these populations to recover a little bit so it might be something that you might want to consider anyways these these are the different Carabidae beetles. There's 40,000 species. 22,000 uh, live in the United States. We got 450 in the Midwest. They'll live anywhere from one to three years. They're pretty much nocturnal. But if you go out into a field and you see a lot of biological life and you can find these guys, then, then uh, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, usually we don't see much of a problem. Every field that I've visited, it's almost deader than a door now. You don't see anything but bulls and slugs. Sometimes I've gone out into these fields, and if you go out there at night, they will literally cover your shoe and go up your pants leg within about five to ten minutes, okay? So when you have that many, you have a major problem, okay? You don't want to get to that point. Here's some other things that, that eat the, uh, the slugs. Centipedes and millipedes uh, eat slug eggs. It's like caviar. The firefly. You know, if you see fireflies across your field, you probably don't have much of a slug issue because they spend the majority of their life, about I think it's about a year and a half, in the soil. When you actually see them blinking around, they're only living for about one more month. They're there to mate. They don't even eat for that month and lay their eggs, and then, then they, they, they appear. Uh, and those eggs will hatch and they're actually stay in the soil and they, they consume a lot of these critters, okay? Uh, the rove beetles are also good. The soldier beetles, wolf spiders will eat uh, slugs. Uh, Daddy long legs. Daddy long legs is actually not a spider. It's a scorpion. Probably didn't know that, but some interesting little facts that we've learned. And then there's other things like praying mantis and people that look at, they really don't eat uh, slugs or things like that. The lady beetle people asked about that no they don't really go after those type of things okay other predators uh, frogs toads could be 25 percent of their diets there's a lot of birds uh, all the birds starlings six percent of their diet so if you've got a healthy bird population they can help mammals that eat them probably the big one that we really uh, that really helps us is that shrew although there's not a lot of shrews out there they're somewhat endangered but even the badgers the fox the raccoons and the possum will will eat slugs, okay? There are a few parasites, there are a few flies, but a lot of that stuff, uh, we're, it's not labeled to, to try to do that here in the United States. They are doing some things in Europe with those, okay? This is John Tooker's data on the neonics. This was data that he published uh, uh, not too long ago. Uh, it just shows it was 2005, uh, but where the, they had more neonics, they had more, uh, actually had more slugs rather than less slugs because they had uh, less predators. It took out the predators. So soybean density was down 19%. Soybean yield actually decreased 5% where they were using the neonic.
Okay, so uh, that has been documented, and uh, they, they were measuring predation, okay? Uh, we got a lot of looking at neonics, how much do you need them? And again, this came from uh, 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 Purdue. Uh, just shows you that, you know, a lot of times we're putting things out there that maybe we don't always need, or maybe there's another product that may be more effective. So uh, you might want to stay. Also, notice the, the stay away from some of them that are, are hurting the, the issue, but also notice the concentration. Uh, some of these companies have really upped. They've gone from the 250 to in uh, just as an insurance policy, they're up to 1250, and that's just that much more chemical out there. And and uh, I, I've talked to Curtis Young, and he's been doing scouting, and he says uh, I'm not finding the pests out there. I'm, I'm not finding, at least in the soybeans, not finding them like like uh, we thought. Well, there's really no need to be putting on that high level of, of some of these things, especially in your soybeans, okay? Now the corn is a little bit different issue, okay? But maybe there's something you can substitute that won't cause quite as much damage. So you need to be aware of, of um, all these chemicals and, and maybe try some things that, that you know. But it's pretty hard now, 95% of all our seed has an insecticide and a fungicide on it, okay? And um, we're probably overdoing it in a lot of, lot of issues, a lot of places, okay? And so you've got to be a little careful. If you don't really need it, you might want to ask. But I understand this. If you do that, you need to do it in the fall. And the problem is you probably will lose all your warranty. So you are taking a risk, okay? I've got to tell you that. Uh, it's on you then to, to do the scouting and make sure you don't have a problem, okay? That's part of the issue there. Neonics only last a short period of time. Time, typically 21 days. That's what their research is showing. Uh, they're about. They're extremely water soluble. Only about five percent stays with the plant. The rest moves with the water. And you can imagine where it goes. Okay, so uh, it is kind of a concern uh, about how much that we're using and and, and where we're at there. Okay, uh, I've already told you about this since we're uh, putting on a much higher populations on soybeans. We're somewhere between 140 to 210 thousand. That's kind of what most farmers are putting on. We might be able to compensate. Maybe you can uh, not put quite as much on there. Allow some of these natural predators to come back. Okay. On corn, it's typically seeded at 30 to 36,000. Some of the major seed pests are your seed corn maggot and your wireworm, which is interesting because if you get good crab -a beetle populations, they also eat those things. So there is kind of that balance that we're, we're trying to do. So they're kind of recommending, you know, Corn seed costs more, put it on that. However, on soybeans, maybe you don't need to put it on as much. Again, you have to have that discussion. Is it possible to not put anything on? And this is some research that came out of uh, uh, South Dakota. This was uh, Dwayne Beck. He made the statement a couple years ago. He got in big trouble by the university. He says, I haven't put any uh, corn uh, insecticide uh, or fungicide on any of my crops for the last 10 years and I don't have a problem. University said you can't say that because we have corn rootworm. So what they did was they did a little study, they went out there to investigate him and they put a thousand rootworm uh, eggs per foot in this, in this cornfield, okay? And they've done this before and every time they've done that they may be able to come back and they find them. Well they did it on his field and they couldn't find any. And they said what's going on? And so they put out some hormo uh, pheromones and things like that, did some more collecting, and they found that Dwayne Beck had on his fields where he's doing long-term no-till, cover crops, no insecticides and uh, fungicides, he has, with a B, one billion predators per acre. Now, uh, corn rootworm don't taste very good, they're yucky. But when you're hungry enough, you'll eat anything, okay? And that's kind of what they're finding out is they had increased predation and they were able to keep them naturally, okay? So it, it does show that we can do this. Is it going to uh, work in every situation? And the answer is you've got to build that population up. It may take you a little bit of time. So there is some risk involved. I want to make sure people are aware of that if you're going to go this route. But 
if you're going to do that, you really need to go make sure you get that environment right so that the predators are out there to take these guys out. Okay, You want to make sure you got that right predator-prey relationship so that the, you get rid of the bad guys. I guess that's what I'm saying. So. Um, one of the things that helps is 95% uh, of the insects and nematodes are beneficial and they help to keep these populations under control. Okay, now we're going to switch to the voles. These are true rodents. So you got looking at all these, uh, the vole is right here. This is the meadow vole. Compare that to the house mice. Compare that to uh, moles. Okay, moles are a little bit bigger. Those are the ones that kind of dig up in your yard. Uh, you know, they're going after the grubs or the the earthworms there, and uh, that's that's it. So we're talking about the meadow mole, which is just really a field mouse, okay? So a lot of people get don't really know what a vole is. There's roughly 60 species. We're really going to concern ourselves with about two. Uh, they have small ears, small eyes, short legs, short tail, kind of a brownish gray, and they're somewhere between three and seven inches long, okay? Um, here's their, their range, and you can see in the United States, the meadow vole is probably the most uh, prolific and has the biggest area. The uh, prairie vole, uh, they have one gene that's different. So what's the difference between a prairie vole and a meadow vole? Meadow voles will basically have a lot of young. Uh, they they uh, will breed with just about anything, okay? They're just constantly having young. Whereas the prairie vole, she has one mate. So there's one gene difference in there, and she will mate for life. If you kill her mate, chances are there's a high percentage chance that she will not remate again, okay? So um, there's kind of pluses and minuses to that. The prairie voles have fewer numbers, but they keep more of them alive because they take care of them, okay? And so if you see, you know, two of them running around together, they're, they're very closely tied to each other. Generally, those will probably be your prairie voles, whereas metal voles, if you only see one at a time, they kind of tend to, you know, uh, I guess they make love and then fight and break up, and that's kind of the way they do it. But uh, that's that's what happens, okay? So a little bit difference in, in uh, uh, the, uh, the genetics on those. Um, Looking at what habitat they like, meadow voles rely really heavy cover. Uh, they like wet areas because they need standing water. Okay, the prairie voles they'll be in your fallow fields. They like hay fields, and they really like alfalfa and things like that. Um, if you look at you know lifespan somewhat similar, it seems like the prairie voles might live just a little bit longer. Their home range can any be anywhere from about a quarter to about one and a half acres, but they migrate. They can uh, the meadow voles are really good swimmers, and they can sw uh, actually swim across streams, and they will range uh, actually go as far as a mile and a half to get to a food source. Okay, where do they hang out when there's not food? Well, they'll go to. I'll show you a picture of this. They go everywhere, along your road ditches, your, your, your streams, in your woods, your wood piles, all those things, okay? They like primarily seeds and vegetation, but they will eat bark. There's nothing else there. Uh, their mortality is very high, and uh, they are widely distributed, okay? Here's the key thing you need to key in on, is they can, uh, their gestation period's 21 days. And so uh, generally they'll be weaned in 12 to 14 days and within another 21 days they're already having babies. Okay, so that's why these meadow voles are so prolific. They can have 40 to 50. I think in captivity the record was uh, one meadow vole had uh, over 87 in, in captivity. Okay, so if you give them food, they can have quite a few. That, Prairie voles don't have quite as uh, many. They have a little bit longer uh, gestation and uh, weaning period uh, and reproducing. They don't reproduce quite as quick, but they're a little stronger and they survive a little bit better. Okay, so that's generally the difference there. How, ma how many can you get? Well, this was a study that was done on the uh, uh, prairie voles in Illinois. Tall prairie grass, they had six voles per acre. The peak was 96. Uh, bluegrass was 21, peak 150, alfalfa fields 40, and 257, okay, per, that's per acre. You look at the metal voles, they average 15 to 45 per acre, they peaked out at 600 per acre, okay. We generally say that if you have more than four or five uh, voles, uh, 
on about a per acre basis uh, colonies, you know, and you'll see the, all you have to do is go out there and see the burrows out there. When you see these, they're kind of in little little areas, okay? When you see that more than that, then you generally got a, a pretty big problem, okay? So that's what you have to do. Summer litters tend to be a little bit larger and more successful than the winter. And this is what it looks like from the air. You'll just see these bare patches here. And what you want to do is you want to start scouting for them about 30 days before planting. Uh, voles can significantly reduce corn and soybean stands for about the first 21 to 28 days. So if you can get that corn up and that soybean up, that's what you want to try to do in that first 21 to 28 days. They can reach up about 6 to 10 inches. Okay. So a lot of times what you'll do is you'll see all this damage when you finally go out and look at them. You'll see this damage, but you may notice that it doesn't seem like there's a lot of bowl activity. Well, once the food is gone and they migrate out and then they'll come back when the food is there. However, if you decide you aren't going to do anything, just decide to replant, well, that's a new food source for them. So they'll come back to their dens. And what you'll see is this kind of odd, uh, kind of odd long, you know, uh, area that they've grazed off. Well, then all of a sudden they'll be going down in between the rows where you redrilled the new. They'll wipe out everything that was in that middle of that hole, but then they'll take it back another 10, 15 feet because that's a new food source. So you really need to be thinking about trying to prevent them before you go back in and planting if you have high uh, vol, vol issues. You got to be thinking about that, okay? This is where they hang out and where they'll migrate great from all these different areas so you need to learn to uh, if, if you've got some areas like that you might want to try to mow these back uh, keep them down a little bit because they don't like the predators coming in that real tall growth uh, really keeps the predators out so brush piles ditches lanes um, uh, hay bales uh, anything like that you can see the list all right these are some of the things that they like to eat they love the red clover, the alfalfa, the dandelion, tall fescue, the giant ragweed, and curly dock. Those are some of the things that they've discovered that some of their preferences. The ones at the top are the most uh, often found when they've done uh, uh, when they've taken some of these and actually cut them open to see what they had in them. This is what they had. Okay, cover crops. They like almost all cover crops except one, and that seems to be crimson clover. Although I've heard one report that they even will eat crimson clover over if their population's high enough, but may not be one of their preferred sources, but they really love cereal rye, okay? And that's one, oats, barley, anything with the grain in it. They just seem to dislike the, the, the crimson clover. They'll sometimes eat insects, slugs, or snails, but that's not their main food source. And they just love any soybeans and the cotyledons. So it's the hardest to control in the soybeans, uh, more so than, than the uh, corn or the wheat, okay? Uh, all right. This is a field in uh, northwest Ohio. It was a 60-acre uh, soybean field. It made eight bushels per acre. Uh, again, we don't have a threshold for the Midwest, but anything greater than five voles um, uh, colonies per acre is, is going to be a concern. So you really need to do some scouting, uh, and I'll give you a couple things that you can do uh, that, that, and uh, while you're doing that. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give it away right now. Get yourself a dog, okay? I'll show you a picture. There's a guy that started a new business, and he's got a rat terrier. And they call them terriers for a reason, because they terrorize mice and rats. This guy had three rat terriers. He killed 250 voles in three hours with three rat terriers. And all they do is they just run and dig and chomp on them, and they don't even eat them. And they really terrorize your voles. They can really bring it down. So he started a whole new business and going out there. If you've got some fields that, that have a problem, uh, now I will tell you one thing. You will no longer have a no-till field when you get done because they will just dig everything up, okay? So they, they do a pretty good job. And I've got some of the species that you can do. Now, I'm, I'm going to suggest this. Whatever you do, if you buy one, you probably don't want to get have the wife get too close to it because if she starts licking it, that dog starts 
starts licking your wife on the face, why, you know, she may not be happy that it's a bowl killer, okay? So, but they are cute. I'll show you some pictures of that here in a little bit. All right, home range is anywhere from 10 to 15 feet. These are the burrows. Uh, they can burrow, you know, they can go as big as a quarter of an acre. Most of the time, the juveniles may stay with the adults if there's plenty of food, but if there's not enough food, the adults kick them out and they're on their own. So that's why you'll see all these new colonies starting up. All right. Um, these are the what it, what it looks like in a, a, a couple of these fields. You can just see these burrows out there. This was a barley field. It was tilled twice. Okay. So tillage is a tool. But it's, it's not, there's no one practice that will take out all your voles. If the population's pretty high, tillage may reduce their numbers, but it's not going to take all of them out. So uh, tillage is one of the things that you can try. However, if you're in a no-till cover crop uh, type of situation, we've got a lot of other things you can do before you have to do the tillage, okay? And tillage will only take maybe 50, 60% of the population down. You're still going to have probably around 40% or more, and they're so prolific that it may not take long before they're back up again, okay? Again, these are our recommendations. Um, seed that at 50%, that will die out. Maybe plant some species that they don't like, okay? These are the predators. There's a lot of different things that eat the voles. Voles represent 40% of all the mammals uh, in, uh, in uh, our area, okay? So everything eats them. They're one of the keystones. Uh, uh, species. And, and you're probably thinking, well, I don't want any bulls at all. Actually, bulls do have a purpose that is beneficial. One, they eat some weed seed, okay? And number two, they help to spread mycorrhizae in our fields. Their little feet, when they go from these uh, uh, non-disturbed areas, they spread mycorrhizae throughout your field. So they do have a purpose. We just want to keep them at a low enough level that they don't cause us economic uh, harm, okay? So these are all the things that we're looking at. All these type of birds actually uh, eat uh, and uh, some of these other bullfrogs, turtles, believe it or not, even trout and things like that, bass will, will eat these things, okay? Uh, this is one of the good guys. This is just, uh, it's called a shrew. I like to say it's a mouth with teeth, or um, a mouse with teeth, okay? Uh, if you ever looked at one, my dog brought one up one day. I didn't know what it was, but it had some nasty teeth on it. Come to find out, it, it's a shrew. You probably don't see many of these because they're very much nocturnal. They live right in the uh, 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 bull burrows. A lot of times they'll take one over, but if you've got some of these, they're they're kind of uh, uh, there's not a lot of them around. Uh, they're almost extinct in some areas, but they are very beneficial. These are the things that really do a number on them: the red-tailed hawks, the rough-legged hawks. Some of these things actually migrate in in the winter. So if you see a lot of birds out there, some hawks out there uh, on your on your fields, um, you know. Uh, you want to promote them because they really bring your vole level down uh, in the in the uh, in the summer or I'm sorry in the winter so that by the time spring comes around you'll have a lot less of them. This is the one we really like. This is the American kestrel. It's actually the uh, a falcon. These things will live uh, 365 uh, days a year. They eat a lot of voles. They also eat slugs. So this is a, a double uh, one that we really want to look. They look they're about the size of a small dove. They're very pretty and we actually have birdhouses. Their territory is somewhere around five, maybe no more than ten acres. So if you get some started, they'll really do a number on your voles and your slugs, okay? And you can see what the different, how they look. They kind of got different looks to them, all right? Some of the screech owls, uh, they eat uh, great great horn owls, uh, screech owls, barn owls, short-eared owls, all these eat owls. A study in Wisconsin showed 95% of the short- Eared owls diet was voles. In Ohio, 90% of the long-eared diet was voles. And one of the things we can do is put perches out there. What you do is you get yourself a, um, a, a post, uh, a fence post, and uh, you put about a one-foot bar. You can put these around these colonies. It gives them a place to rest. And you'll even know how many voles you got because when the hawks and the owls eat that, what they'll do is uh, they'll spit out the bones and the pellet, they'll form like a pellet and you can actually count the pellets underneath the, 
uh, of your perches, okay? Now, if you're going to do perches, what you want to do is paint them a bright color because one of the things we found is the deer like to scratch their back on them. They'll knock them down. And the last thing you want to do is run it through your equipment because you don't know where your, your perch is. But either make a map or GPS them paint them a bright color, and you can even move these things around. I got some data that shows you how effective these things are uh, in a year where there wasn't a whole lot of voles. You got to remember that. Uh, they just did a study on that. So this shows you some of the predators, how they can help to control them. Will they wipe them out? No, but they can keep them at a lower, low enough level. But you got to have access. You don't want to have cover crops that are way too tall because they can't get in there, okay? The coyotes and the fox, uh, the fox are actually a little better because they're more localized. The coyote are wide ranging. The coyote eats more, but if you've got a field and you've got a den of fox, that's gold uh, because they will, will really go out there, okay? Tell you a quick story about um, some coyotes, though. A friend of mine had uh, uh, had a 120 acre field. He noticed a coyote coming across, so he got out his gun, put some slugs in there, uh, some so shotgun shells or slugs. I'm not sure what he had, but, anyways, he's sitting at his kitchen table. The coyote comes across and all of a sudden the tail goes up and it hunches over and it jumps and it grabs a bowl, throws it up, swallows it whole. And he's like, well, that was interesting. So he drinks his coffee. All of a sudden it goes along, goes a little further. It stops. Tail goes up. He jumps, grabs another bowl. Well, after about the fourth or fifth time, the guy drank his coffee, he unloaded his gun, put it away, said, if he's going to eat that many bowls, I'm going to let him alone. Okay? So watch. If you've got an issue with bowls, try not to overhunt it. Some of these guys now have these specialized dogs, and they can really wipe out. Somebody told me the other day, uh, and they area, I think right here in this county, they took out 135 coyotes, okay? Now, you know, if, if you don't want the coyotes, maybe just try to leave at least uh, the fox around there or something. I don't, you know, but we got to have that balance if we've got these issues, okay? All right. This is the box. I actually have three of these on my farm. Uh, they're per pretty good size. You want to place them up on your telephone poles or, or a high area, about 10 to 30 feet high. You'll actually see these kestrels, uh, on these telephone poles. It needs a three inch hole and you want to face them to the southeast, okay? South or the east is recommended. But if you can get them going, uh, they'll help you quite a bit. These are the perches and they found that they greatly increase predation, anywhere from three to 30 times in uh, kestrel breeding pairs, okay? So they are very effective. This just shows you another example of it. They prefer that they be about 10 foot tall, okay? But the deer can be an issue because they'll scratch and knock them down, make sure you know where they're at. All right, here's some actual data. We gave uh, some grant money, NRCS did, to Purdue. They have a, a, a specialist there. And they put out 24 perches in eight cover crop fields. This was done uh, February through April. Again, they came back and said we really didn't have that many voles this year. Had a lot to do with the weather uh, last uh, winter, but these are the numbers. And they will say that these numbers are off a little bit. They had great horn owl, the American kestrel, red-tailed hawk, rough-legged hawk, okay? Uh, those, some of those came uh, are species that were probably overwintering, okay? 140 visits, 21 perches, about seven visits per perch is what they found. And it really didn't matter where you put them in the field. All right, so again, there's that fox, the, the, the coyotes. Uh, they do eat some. You might want to be careful. What about the cats? We don't recommend feral cats because they eat a lot of songbirds. Uh, they're not real reliable. But here are some species of dog that you might want to look. Look at those cute things, okay? But as they say, those rat terriers are a real terrier to the to the voles, all those things. I know my dog uh, does a pretty good job at keeping the voles down locally right around our house. So that is something that you can look at. All right. Well, how are you going to manage them? You're going to manage for food, shelter, uh, the predators. You got There's some cultural practices, things like rotary hoeing, harrowing, zone tillage. All those things will get your crops off to a little bit quicker start. Uh, chaff spreading. Spread your chaff out. Uh, row cleaners uh, help just to move that 
that residue away from the plants, draper headers, and also look at your harvesting height. We kind of recommend in these no-till fields that you harvest your corn high, leave it standing, and that will allow that uh, area to dry out a little bit and it will change the environment. You can use the trap crops and the baits. They're not all that effective. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, everything I've read about baits is, first of all, they're expensive. They really don't work that well because you're putting them into a moist environment. So within about 24 hours, they start to mold. And if I'm a bull or a slug, do I want to eat something that's highly processed or do I want young, less, uh, lush vegetation? So the other thing is both the bulls and the slugs become can become used to the bait. And if they don't eat a lethal dose, they won't touch it again. So you can actually teach your bulls and slugs not to like the baits, and they're pretty expensive. Interesting statistic. Most of the things that they've said in the literature is he says, well, the baits uh, uh, can be used, you know, farmers will use them, but generally you have to use them for two to five years before they're effective. Let's see, about every two to five years we have a cycle where we have this boom and bust, and generally it's the boom and bust in the weather that takes them out, not the bait. So just my personal opinion a little bit mixed in with that. Uh, if you want to try them, if you're desperate, you can spend the money on it. I've got a little bit of information on that came from Purdue. But uh, again, um, uh, any effective con uh, slug control, any of these things, or uh, bowls, maximum control is only 60% with about one practice. Okay, um, already talked about that. One key thing, though, uh, that almost all the literature in the past talked about is killing the cover crops early, about 30 days before you started to plant. Now, we have a lot of guys now that are doing green planting. They'll, they'll plant into it green. Should I stop my green planting? Well, here's, here's the answer to that. If you don't have a bowl and slug problem, just keep on doing what you're doing. If you start to have a bowl and slug problem, then you might need to modify it and try some of these other practices, see if you can get it down. But generally, what we're finding is that those guys that are planting green have enough natural predation in there that uh, it's helping to take. Do they have slugs? Do they have bowls? I've talked to a number of guys. They all have slugs and bowls. They're just not a big enough problem that they even worry about it. They have enough natural predation going on, and, and it seems to be working for them. So you've got to determine. Drilling the crop is always better. Uh, if you can drill that seed, that's one thing that we recommend. These are just some of the implements that you might try, the row cleaners, the zone tillage, just again to warm up that soil, dry it out, uh, change the environment so you can get that corn or beans up to... Uh, uh, fast, get it fast growing. Trying to use the uh, rotary hoe. Several guys have done that where they had slug issues, and it seems to be working really well for them. Uh, if you can get out there sometime in the fall or early spring, some guys are doing it right before they plant, and uh, that's working out for them if, if they've already killed their cover crop early. Okay, spread that chaff because that chaff is a haven for both the bulls and the slugs. So we want to do that. Um, again, do you need to do it? Not necessarily. If you've got a good, if you don't have, a, if you're not having a problem, you don't have to worry about it. Here's a way that you can look for slugs. Just put out these shingles or an old board and uh, start looking at them in the fall. So you kind of got an idea what you what you have, and then look at them again in the spring. Uh, this is Oregon data. We have no numbers here for Ohio, but Oregon said if you had one to two slugs, that's a low number. If you have two to three, that's a medium. If you're getting over four to five, then, then you probably have an issue, okay? So you want to kind of use that as an indicator. You need to put these out about maybe five, ten different places in your field and uh, check them because uh, slugs can be in isolated areas. So uh, you want to make sure you know uh, what's going on. And then with the voles, while you're looking at them, you can look to see where if you've got any uh, vole uh, dens and burrows out there, okay? Um, I'm going to skip that. These are some things you might try. The radish seem to be a natural fumigant for the slugs. They're high in sulfur. A lot of guys are also using the cereal rye, and they're planting those in 30-inch rows. The slugs will attack the cereal rye. It's kind of a trap crop, and they'll leave the corn alone. The corn will actually grow, and then it can outgrow some of that. So some people are using the cereal rye. Other people have tried winter peas, and they'll eat the winter peas that are growing in the spring. By the time they get around to the corn, the corn 
acorns up big enough and uh, they'll outgrow them. Okay? This is an example of winter peas. Bill Richards done this on his farm. It helped him with the slugs. This is an example of the cereal rye where he put it in 30 inch rows. This is Lucas uh, Griswell in Pennsylvania. So it, it just show that guys are experimenting with this. They've documented this. John Tucker's documented that these trap crops can work. Doesn't work as well on your soybeans. Here's the information on uh, slug baits. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. If you want more information, I really, to be honest with you, I my recommendation is I don't see them being all that effective, but if you really want to do it and you're desperate, these would be the things. Okay, so I'm going to skip through some of this. And again, I went through this. The effectiveness really goes down. They're only effective, about 60% effective the first day within 48 hours. Uh, you can have a problem. So you got to pick the right night for scouting and baiting. Uh, and the heavy slug mig migration occurs almost each night, so they can come in from the borders. So you might spray an area, and uh, you might think you got them under control, and then conditions change and they move in. Okay, so that's the key thing. Key time to treat it in Ohio uh, would be April to May or September to early October if that's what you're going to do. All right, for the slugs, you can use the uh, uh, the, the pellets. Uh, deadline is an example at uh, 25 pounds to the acre on corn, 10 pounds on soybeans. It costs us somewhere around about 20, 25 bucks, just depending on the rate. OSU says you need four to five pellets. Purdue says you need five to eight. So it does vary.